Ben Pearson, Roaster Tracker, and today I want to talk a little bit about how you organize a constellation of communication satellites, such as the uh, SpaceX Starlink satellites that were recently launched here. Now, what you see in front of you at this moment is a visualization of where all of the Starlink satellites are at this particular moment that I'm recording. You can see the little circles they have here. This is a 40 degree circle. That is the area over which one of these satellites will provide the expected coverage that uh, Starlink will provide when it is ultimately fully serviceable. You can see it's a fairly small area, but they're starting to spread out. I found it kind of interesting that there's really a few different groups that they're spread out over. It looks like three at this moment with a few satellites here that are in a particularly different thing. You can ignore the names. These names come from JSPOC. And JSPOC has not yet released official names. They haven't been able to identify exactly where all of these are. We can see here from the attitude of a randomly chosen object that its altitude is slowly raising over time. Although, to be fair, this is pretty imprecise. It's really hard to get good, accurate information at this stage in the game. But how is it that these constellations of satellites actually work? To answer that, we're going to look at two different constellations that have slightly different purposes that are also low Earth orbit communication satellites. We're gonna look first at the well-known Iridium constellation, and then we're gonna look a little bit at Orbcom, which is best well known for the launch that SpaceX finally nailed the landing of a booster. So there you go, and we'll see how these two different things compare. When you're looking at the Iridium constellation of satellites, it doesn't seem like there's a huge amount of order. You can see different groups here but you can really see much better what's going on in the 3D view. Ah, that is much better. You can see here there's really a number of different planes of the satellites that are closely grouped together with a couple of small exceptions here. And they each have a certain amount of distance between them and they're kind of following the same path. That path will slowly rotate with time as you can see, but they'll pass over the same parts of the sky. There are a couple of instances where there's pairs of satellites those are probably on orbit spares but for the most part that's how these work and it's a very very clear order we can see here how this actually works in principle now i've assumed that you need a five degree swath to be able to talk to things but you can see that there's very well covered gaps that really everything is very perfectly aligned and this is the benefit of the cluster that they have. A good satellite constellation will do this and it's organized in these planes that you see. Now Starlink will be organized in a much much larger number of planes for a couple of reasons. First of all they're going to be orbiting closer to the earth and second of all this 40 degree angle is really really large to be able to see the horizon. That's practically straight overhead in terms of what these satellites can do. And that will severely limit the actual amount of contact they can have on the ground. But you can get a pretty good idea and you can see that there really is continual coverage everywhere here with this Iridium cluster, the way that they've got it. Now let's compare this to Orbcom. This is the Orbcom satellite. Now these satellites don't care as much about the real-time measurements as they do about just providing something relatively quick. And I have the two generations as different colors because there really are two generations of Orbcom satellites that are operational. The yellow ones are the older ones and the red ones are the newer ones. And you can see here kind of how their constellations, they do have planes, but it's not nearly as uniform as the Iridium constellation of satellites is. And let's take a look at this in the 3D. Now, in 3D, you can see the planes a little bit more, and it looks like, to some extent, some of the new OG2 satellites are supplementing some of the OG1 satellites in their various constellations. They kind of have these planes mapped out, although there are a couple of oddballs that are in there. There's one satellite that is in a nearly sun-synchronous orbit 
that looks like it can provide communications. It's one of the older ones. And we have a couple of other drifters like this FM33, which I'm not sure what it's doing there, but it could be attempting to do some kind of a plane change or it could just have been an older plane that wasn't there. This different style of planes will lead to some gaps. And let's take a look at the coverage map to see how that happens. But it requires many fewer satellites and much less order than the Iridium cluster does. And so it can be preferred for some applications. You can see the different satellites here as they're moving along. And you can see that there's definitely some coverage gaps here. Now, these are okay for the purpose of Orbcom that's primarily focused on these relatively infrequent reports, although you can see that there are some periods of time where there will be some fairly significant gaps. As a whole, it does what it's intended to do, and these are much, much lower value ones. Now, it's really interesting to see how these different things work. If you're going to build your own constellation of satellites, you need to figure this out. How important is it that you have continual coverage over something? If the answer is, well, it's not, then you could get away with something like this. That's just a fewer satellites that are kind of a little bit more chaotic. If it is really important, you probably want something like the Iridium satellites. The way that Starlink is going, I'm kind of curious how it's going to turn out. The way that I think this is going to happen based off of how I see these separate now is some of these are actually going to be in a different plane. And the way that you achieve a different plane is you have a slightly different orbital altitude. And with time, these planes will shift. And eventually, you're no longer really in the same plane that you started out with. Now, this can be to a huge advantage if that's what you want to do. Orbcom satellites, for instance, were all launched in a two launches, but they were launched into four different planes for the OG2 satellites. Although whether or not they've actually achieved that, it's hard to tell from what we saw. But you can get a fairly good idea of how that's going to be. I'm really curious, though, if these are actually going to end up being different planes or not. Time will tell. It would make some sense. You wouldn't want to have one plane that had all of the satellites from the original generation, especially since these ones will not be able to communicate across the ocean from satellite to satellite. So we'll see what happens. But it's really exciting to see this many satellites that's all going to be here for a concerted purpose. You can see how important it is that they'll have so many satellites. You can see that these satellites are passing one of them roughly over Spain as a country. And that's roughly what the size of these are. These are not going to be particularly large, so it's something to pay attention to. Anyways, thank you guys very much for joining me. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have about satellite planes or Starlink, and I'll do my best to answer them. Until next time, keep on tracking and take care.